generous. So I'm going to enjoy my short contribution, then you can have coffee. Um, <laughs> and uh, thank the organizers, Claudio, again, uh, for the chance to come to Sicily. And I think I'll be coming again shortly. So <laughs> still things to see. So I should really uh, uh, get a move on now. So what I'm going to try and do is um, give you a few, uh, two or three examples of things that I'm mainly working in uh, projects myself um, to illustrate the kind of nuclear reactions uh, and approach to measuring those reactions for explosive astrophysical scenarios. And the key issue here is one's dealing in general with hot, dense environments where it's the reactions and the properties of unstable nuclei that are critical to determine the path of nucleosynthesis. And this shows that it's a dynamical process of before and after an image of uh, a Novi explosion. And I think it's quite important at the outset of the talk to say the topics I'm trying to concentrate on where there's maybe just one, two or three reactions that are important. So in contrast, for example, to what you were discussing with many different nuclei involved, we're now focusing on just a few. Um, so what's our model of the Novi? Now, I knew I was speaking after Ami, so I had to keep this uh, slide for her. Um, she likes this fellow because of his hair, but actually he had another claim, one or two claims to fame besides his hair. And uh, it was actually Newton, I got this uh, quote from Geordie Jose, um, and look how long ago he came up with this basic idea of where the energy came from to power a nova. Now that kind of should make you humble when we actually think what we're doing now and the little in incremental steps. And just by seeing a light go off in the sky, Newton said there must be some fuel somewhere there. And so this was an example of a binary system. Now, in nuclear astrophysics, in the lives of stars, the more massive you are, like rock stars, you tend to die young, and things happen a lot quicker. So in fact, the, the thing that's small here is the white dwarf, okay, which would originally have been a bigger star. It's prevented from collapse by electron degeneracy pressure. So when material falls onto the surface, unlike, for example, an ideal gas, which would expand and cool, the material and energy just keeps going on the surface until it's then ejected. And this shows a model of the predictions of the abundance, the elemental abundances that one can observe uh, from the ejector. Now, zero represents the solar abundances, the ratio to solar abundances. So I'm an experimentalist, but what I do remember is that log one is zero. So that's what that means. So this line going across here are solar abundances. Now, in Novi, last time I looked, though occasionally in conferences you hear something slightly different, the heaviest elements expected to be produced are around up to calcium in Novi explosions. So that's your, one of your observables, but there's a very interesting aspect, in particular the ratio of these two points here, silicon 30 and silicon 28, is used to uh, characterize Novi grains as being associated with ejection of material sometime in the past from a single Novi event. So when you have a very high abundance ratio of uh, silicon 30 to silicon 28, that's a characteristic that it was a Novi explosion originally emitting that. Now, as I said, in Novi, there's probably just two or three reactions we still don't know well enough, and this is the one we don't know well enough, okay? The phosphorus 30p gamma. So to try and understand briefly, we look at the, uh, now I'll make sure I don't switch the whole computer off, and I think that's all right. So all the blue ones are stable, the pink ones are unstable, and the reason people, astrophysicists talk about bottlenecks, but that's like you should always check you, your wallet hasn't been stolen when a nuclear astrophysicist say it's a bottleneck. They're just trying to convince you usually that that's the really important one and all the others aren't important. But actually, this really is one of the ones where it's, it's funneling through and it's critical. So at this point here, the nucleus can either be to decay or it can proton capture and then go on produce these heavier elements up to around calcium 40. So you say, okay, do the experiment. But this is where chemistry hits you. And it's not easy to produce low energy phosphorus 30 beams. Uh, it's, it's just not easy to get that out of an iron source. So you can't just say, let's dial it up 
and measure that. So we have to find some indirect methods to do that. So nobody showed that this morning, so I think probably I will. It's a good time. I, I wasn't sure whether to keep it in. But this is showing you the uh, convolution of the barrier penetration factor and the Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, distribution. And you get the familiar Gamow peak, uh, which Pierre actually did mention. And one of the critical things here is that if you have a resonance in the system somewhere sitting in that region, it can completely ignite the reaction process. There can be actually be many resonances in there, but one of the things Pierre also said, he reminded you of the importance of the centrifugal barrier. People don't uh, usually forget about that. But the important thing is if there's a few states with L equals zero, L equals one capture, they can completely change it all. So the first thing we did was to do a study um, uh, about two or three years ago at the uh, Gamma Sphere Array at Argonne National Laboratory. This device, which is over 20 years old and cost, uh, was it $15 million? Uh, and was designed to look at spin 60, spin 70 states in high spin collisions. But now it's become a really important device for studying astrophysical resonances. And we did something embarrassing, which the argon pack, you might know that argon is a, a wonderful heavy iron accelerator. And they said, well, actually, we want to go back to Rutherford's time and have a beam which was six or seven MeV alpha particles. Why did we do that? Because we wanted to study low spin states, because we wanted to select out the states with low angular momentum where there's a high barrier penetration probability. So what we actually did was a fusion reaction here, uh, alpha particle and silicon 28, and just look for gamma rays from uh, self 31. Now I have no intention of describing the details, but all I want to show you is we saw some critical states and from the angular distributions we're able to determine their spin, okay? This one will be important, 196 kV, this, this bit here. This humble little shoulder will turn out to be very important. The problem with this, it's the first step in the process. It's identifying where the important resonances are, but you still don't know the strengths of those resonances. So I noticed Akram left, so we can all relax, actually, because I was wondering how much theory to do and what statements to make about spectroscopic factors and resonances, and so on. Now I can relax. I think I'm safe. Uh, <laughs> So there you are. Now I can give you my reaction theory slide. <laughs> so actually, Akram was involved with some of this early proposal. So that's the definition of a resonance strength. There's a spin factor of the compound nucleus, and then the channel spins here. So it's a statistical factor. But the important thing are these partial widths here. For these resonances, the total is the sum of the proton width and the gamma width. And it's counterintuitive because if one of the widths dominates in the total width, the thing that determines the resonance strength is the smaller width. In this case, when we're dealing with states only just above the threshold, it's actually the, the proton width that's the smallest. Now, sometimes people think something goes above the barrier, uh, above the threshold, it just particle decays. That's, that's, that's wrong, usually. <laughs> what it usually does is gamma decay. It has to be sufficiently energetic. The barrier has to have a low L, and, and then you can get particle decay occurring over gamma emission. But just being above the threshold isn't enough. So the interesting thing is we saw gamma decays from these states. So what we now need to do is get an estimate of the, the proton partial width, or we can say it now, spectroscopic factor, yeah? I'm not going to have a riot now, okay. So that's, that's what I call a transfer reaction, a kind of peripheral process where there's either pickup or stripping of a single particle. It's an experimental talk. You want your coffee, that's going to be good enough for now, yes? So I now want to tell you about a, a measurement we did, um, what we thought a sort of new technique to try and use transfer reactions as a surrogate for this particular P-gamma um, reaction. And I will, if the audience is awake, they can ask me a question, what the hell are you on about, Phil, here in a moment? So the idea was to measure the DN reaction um, and to determine its strength as an integral measurement, um, to determine the cross-section uh, cross and then measure um, 
the resonance strength, get an estimate of the resonance strength would be fair. So this experiment was performed uh, at MSU at the NSCL. It used a primary beam of 150 MeV V O U arg on 36 ions, fragmented on uh, beryllium here, and it was degraded in energy to beam. They weren't sure if they could do this, but they did it wonderfully well. So we ended up with 30 MeV over U phosphorus 30 ions, a beam of about a million particles per second. These were impinged on a target here, which was surrounded by something called gratina. Gratina, if you don't know it, is a gamma array, but it's with a tracking capability. So it's well adapted to studying experiments where you have significant Doppler shifts as you do when you have relatively high velocities. And then with about 150, uh, sorry, 100% efficiency, I was using a sporting metaphor of, uh, I did 110%. Um, actually, if you saw the movie Bedazzled, that's a good quote there. I always put 110% in, but actually it's 100% efficiency. And now, is anybody going to say, what's crazy? I'm measuring a DN reaction, but have I, what haven't I shown in there? Come on, you go wake up. Brilliant, thank you. Planted in the audience. Uh, <laughs> no, that was actually somebody being intelligent and awake, just for give Jeff some credit. So it, this was something we thought about. What we actually want, neutrons are horrible, and you don't get high efficiency, and you don't get high resolution. But what we wanted to do is replace that with Gratina, which has high resolution and fairly good efficiency. And so the idea here is when we identified the states in the gamma sphere study, we can tag on those states with the gamma rays in Gratina. So now I'll first of all show you, this is the beam, so this is the particle ID, so most of it's there, and there we see the self-31, which is pecked up, so we're producing self-31. Now we then gate on those particles, and then we do two experiments. One, we use deuterated polythene, which is the red, but we have to be careful because we can see the right gamma rays but through reactions on carbon. So we have to run with ordinary polythene as a control. And the critical thing is, is this resonance at 6327, which is produced, this is a direct gamma decay to the ground state, so it's not that efficient, this device. It's a fairly high energy gamma ray, and you can see it's not present when we have just the CH2. Now this is really remarkable, I think, these are all the states that sit inside the burning window for phosphorus 30 P gamma, yeah? There are a lot of states. It's not House of Feshbach. Mike, you, can, you like House of Feshbach sometime. Um, and on the other hand, there's a kind of intermediate number of states. But what it turns out is one of those is the Goldilocks state with the right energy, with the right angular momentum, and it's this one that is picked out. It's about 195 uh, kV. So of all those states, it's that one. And you know, there's something beautiful in nuclear astrophysics. I come at it from a nuclear physics perspective, a perspective and then evolved into doing a bit. I still don't consider myself a true nuclear astrophysicist, but one of the things that's attractive is little bits of nuclear structure can change what's going on in a star. Now, the famous one is the Hoyle state. It sits just at the right energy. But this one was very interesting because when we got these results, we checked with Alex Brown, the shell model theorist, and he said, well, you can look for negative parity states. This is above 6 MeV, and they're very pure. This is an SD shell nucleus, yes, with positive parity states. But you can go up to 6 MeV, and you normally think those states would be very mixed states, yes? But because they're negative parity, they're almost pure shell model states. So it's picking out a pure negative parity state, yeah? So it's nuclear physics. Let's just switch the reaction on, and that's the reaction that's doing it. It appeals to me. It doesn't change the reaction rate in the star, but, you know, it's fun. The second topic um, that I want to consider is uh, one in which uh, we're trying to understand the abundance of the cosmic gamma ray emitter aluminum 26. It's got a lifetime of about a million years, and it was essentially telling us that nucleosynthesis is ongoing in the universe. And now there are many different measurements of, uh, for example, core collapse 
supernovae in the remnants of iron 60 and aluminum 26, and we need to fulfill our part of the bargain, which is understanding the nuclear physics. So what's shown here is the gamma ray, which is the 2 plus to 0 plus transition of magnesium 26, which is from fed by the beta decay of aluminum 26. We're sitting around here, so the, the telescope mission, the satellite telescope mission, sees a distribution of the flux across the galactic plane. Experiments have evolved to the extent that they can even measure the Doppler shift of that gamma ray. So we're really getting detailed information. So we need to fulfill our side of the bargain. What's our understanding from this work about where this aluminum 26 is being produced? Well, it's thought to be associated with this life cycle. This is a, a kind of a rather 30 solar mass star and shows its cycle of accreting material, burning reaction starting, and then ending up finally with a core collapse supernovae. So, and in fact, it turns out that material can be ejected into the interstellar medium either during the hydrogen burning period or following the explosion. So this period here, we can have much less rate of material, but happening over a long period of time, that's associated with hydrogen burning. And this core collapse one uh, is a second mechanism which can contribute, but all from the same star. So I've not got so much time. So this is basically the uh, cycle of reactions that we think are responsible in the hydrogen burning component. Um, that's in that uh, part of the uh, stellar evolution. And we need to understand all those reactions, whoops, it's going slow, so that we can understand what, for example, the integral satellite is actually measuring. Um, because time's short, I usually ask the audience another question. I won't this time. The yellow bit there is an isomer. Uh, I'll save that for Santa Tecla. They didn't answer it two years ago. We'll see if they learn. Um, so then we have the uh, destruction reaction, which is the most uncertain thing, is this uh, P-gamma reaction on aluminum 26. So what have people done? Well, in this case, this is a wonderful experiment was done at about 10 years ago at the, Dragon at the Dragon separator, which did a direct measurement of the P-gamma reaction. Remember, aluminum 26 is a million years long, so actually it's not so difficult to produce. And they were able to, to cut a long story short, to make a measurement of the resonance strength at 189 kV. Interestingly, that's almost certainly the critical resonance for novae, but if novae aren't the main source of aluminum 26, the most important thing to ask is, could there be lower energy resonances during this quiescent period of burning in the evolution of this massive star? We did an experiment at Argon where we saw another state below that in energy, and we wanted to go and explore states lower than that. Now in this case, we did the DP reaction, and in this case, we were producing the analog nucleus. So we're not looking at silicon 27, but we'd identified the analog states between aluminum 27 and silicon 27. This is probably the world's greatest radioactive beam. This is a radioactive beam. It's nearly 10 to the 9 particles per second. This is quantum snooker. You put a high energy beam onto a target, and like in Rutherford's famous scattering experiment, the proton comes backwards at you. You have a heavy particle and the light one comes back. It's quite a fun experiment. So we positioned our detectors in the backward direction. And this, uh, Vincent will have spoken in the uh, parallel sessions earlier as part of his thesis. And this is not a gamma ray spectrum. This is a particle spectrum. And the ground state of aluminum 26 is 5 plus. So look at all the states that are produced. They're all the high spin ones. But Phil, you said it's the low angular momentum that's important. Yes, but it's the angular momentum that's transferred. Yeah? So if you start with 5 plus and you end up with 9 half plus, that's only L equals 0. So it's the transferred angular momentum. So if we look at the bit that's important for the astrophysics, we see the importance of resolution. And this is the important analog state. Some experiments would suggest that wasn't important. However, if you do uh, the analysis there, and there we have the 
angular distributions, this is a pure uh, L equals zero state, very nice fit. This is the important state here. It's actually a combination of L equals zero and L equals two. And for fun, I show you the state that was measured uh, at Triumph, where they just measured the cross section. And magically, by the way, that's another pure negative parity state. It's nuclear structure coming in here. It's, it's a real, I haven't got time to say, but this is beautiful data. <laughs> and what I'd like to say is, also, that as a paper just come out from work at H. Rubef, which is studying the same reaction. Um, by the way, I have to say, oh, I've got five minutes, so I can just have a political moan. So this data that I'm showing you, we, we I think as scientists, good to have a little moan. Um, we submitted this paper before Easter, and we haven't had the referee reports back. I don't know what's going on there. I'm only just saying that. We all, uh, people can sort of think of their own experiences at the moment, but there's some strange things happening there. I know in the journals I'm an editor of, we would expect to be a bit quicker. Okay, enough said. Anyway, this, uh, we're trying to get this through. Now, the beautiful thing about this measurement is if we extrapolate this to this 127 keV resonance, this was the one directly measured at Triumph, the temperatures of interest in this hydrogen burning uh, quiescent phase are here, they're below 10 to the 8 Kelvin. So it's actually this state that's dominating the destruction, purely that state, just that one state again is being picked out by the star and that's what's determining the destruction reaction. Now, okay, I've got five minutes. So this is a reaction conference. I won't motivate this astrophysically because I don't have time. But I now want to tell you about an experiment we did about two years ago on the heavy ion storage ring at GSI, studying reactions. What we, why we want to do this is one of the advantages, you can use pure hydrogen targets and repeatedly recirculate the beam. The beam has a frequency of rotation within the ring of about a megahertz. So you can compensate for the thinness of the target um, by the frequency of rotation. So in this experiment uh, from the cis synchrotron, beams of neon 20 or 50 MeV over U were injected. We actually wanted neon 21, but it seems the world supply of neon 21 disappeared about 20 years ago, probably in Pennsylvania, I think. Anyway, so if we look more closely, here's the target. We have a strip detector which will measure the deuteron and at, for, at the forward distances, which is actually seven meters away, so this is not to scale, what we're trying to do is to, to see if we see either a coincident neon 19 or oxygen 15. So we want to see what the branching ratio for the decay is. So this shows a pocket in which the detectors were placed. The, de the pocket has to be moved in and out because when the beam's cooling, it has a very uh, big diameter. So unlike normal experiments where you just fix your detector, here your detector has to be able to move out and in depending on if the beam's cooling or not. So we, we had ended up with a few hours, it was a very dramatic experiment, and I haven't got time to tell you, all sorts of crazy thing happened with storage ring experiments. Um, and this was showing you could do transfer reactions <coughs> studies with a heavy ion storage ring facility. The arrows here are where the known states are uh, in neon 19. So they're not meant to say this is this state, it's just showing it. And nature has told, found us at least one state which is clean, so we can see the kind of resolution we get, which is 200 kV. Now that's actually determined by the beam spot size. You can ask me about that later. This was part of a thesis of Dan Doherty. Now the problem there, yeah, that's fine. You're gonna be as nice to me as Annie, yes? <laughs> There's a Notre Dame thing going on down here. But I, <laughs> so, in the previous experiments, actually with stable beams, and if you use a radioactive beam on the ESR, it takes about a minute to cool it and reduce the energy. So what you really want to do is to be able to inject the ions immediately at the energy of interest. So this is a new project um, which is called TSR at Isolde, which is to move a heavy ion storage ring from the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg um, to CERN uh, to go on the end of Isolde. So Maria, you're here, I hope I'm doing the right thing here. Um, so this is the plan. Uh, so there we have the new high is older complex. Maria, Maria talked about that. 
The beam line goes up here. This is a service tunnel to LHC, so we, the particle physicists wouldn't let us destroy that for our ring. Um, and what I was told yesterday by a not very authoritative source, I can't see hands in the <laughs> was that the latest politics is, is in the medium term plan. I don't know, it might oscillate still. Yeah, I'm getting a nod. So at the moment, this project is like every other lab in the world, it's suffering tight financial constraints. This is gonna happen, it's just how fast it's gonna happen. So very briefly, in the UK, we just got a significant amount of funding to build detection systems here, and this shows a basic concept for in-ring measurements, where again, you have to be able to move detectors in and out according to when uh, the system, uh, the beams injected in or not. The resolution is important. We expect it to be just limited by the transverse emittance. Yeah, that's all right, I'm there. 10 kV resolution with a radioactive beam. That's, that's gonna give you something new. So the summary is that we, I hope I've convinced you with this little potpourri of experiments that we're making progress on charged particle reactions, but I'm gonna ask you to indulge me. Thank you to people in RECON for letting us have AIDA, because we've now commissioned it, and we're now gonna do some experiments on, on beta-delayed neutron emission and so on with AIDA, but I think I couldn't resist without ending with neutron-induced reactions, because this is the big problem for our community. So in Giel, what I didn't have time to show you was in the core collapse supernova phase, the, in, the important un, missing reaction is aluminum 26 NP. So uh, at Giel, and also at the Entoff facility next year in CERN, we're measuring the neutron, which is a radioactive beam, on aluminum 26, which we're now using as a radioactive target, and if you look here, we have time of flight and the energy, and we can see already two resonances. And this, other people had seen these before, but there was a factor of two disagreement between the measurements, so we're addressing that. So the big problem in the field is how do you measure neutron capture reactions on radioactive species that don't last a million years? I've run out of time, so I'll leave that hanging. Thank you. Oh, it's, they don't need to ask any. Uh, Jeff, yeah. This uh, Gratina measurement is really nice. Uh, is it possible for you to get an estimate of the uh, resonance strength from the cross-section or the... Which the, one? For the, uh, the DN measurement. The DN, yeah, because that relies on reaction theory. And uh, uh, in fact, Akram went out, but in Philomena Nunes is doing calculations for us at MSU. We actually did aluminum 2060N, where the resonance strengths are known, and those are agreeing quite nicely now. So we actually have a control in the same experiment. We did two different ones. Well, these are, as you know, completely unknown, these ones. So, but but the, there's absolutely nothing known about the strength. So it's, it's a start. <laughs> You still have Rhea, yes? <laughs> hey, any more questions? Yeah, you put me out of my misery and go for coffee, yes? Okay, everybody <laughs> waits for coffee. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you.